so much brilliance on this panel. Representation, equity, inclusive, empowered. So much brilliance on this panel. The bulk of the bullying that I was experiencing, hateful, terrible, terrible. The systemic change has to happen. Why are you sharing it with your friends? In this conversation, Megan unintentionally reveals many of the linguistic tactics she uses to garner sympathy and get people to join her community. What are these tactics and what do they reveal about her personality and agenda? This video exposes the agenda behind the nice sounding terms and phrases that we hear from celebrities and politicians on a daily basis. If it's your first visit to this channel and if you're excited about language, feel free to subscribe for more videos. Time to get this empowering journey started. I want to start with you, Megan. Yesterday, the Gina Davis Institute and the advocacy organization Moms First reached a re released a report that your foundation, R12, supported examining the cultural portrayals of motherhood in television. Can you tell us about why this project interested you and what the study found? Megan's among Time Magazine's most influential people and the Financial Times' 25 most influential women. As we all know, influential is a completely reliable term and titles don't lie. So I'm excited to see how Megan will answer this. You guys will tell me if this is a good volume then, yes? Okay. Um, well, thank you. And I'm just, firstly, I'm so excited to be here and to be with such incredible women. So much brilliance on this panel. And a this hints at what is going to become a pattern in this inspiring conversation. Generic statements that I aimed at making the speakers and the audience feel good at the expense of truth. There's nothing like being called incredible and brilliant before the conversations even started. There's a big difference between flattery and praise. Um, yes, as you were saying, the Gina Davis Institute and Moms First released this report, and my husband and I, our foundation, the R12 Foundation, first commercial break, helped to fund it. Because I think from our standpoint, and certainly from mine, there are three key reasons why it felt vital to see the information they were going to be pulling through this report. So, In case you're wondering, yes, the question was asked 40 seconds ago. However, Megan's preface doesn't mean that she's about to give a specific, much less useful answer. On a personal level, I've just always loved understanding women and our stories and our lived experiences and our shared experiences. So I was really curious to see what the report was going to uncover in terms of, oftentimes as women, you may agree with this, the way that we see ourselves is reflected back to us sometimes accurately and sometimes much to our disservice, inaccurately, in what we see in media. Megan uses the pronoun we associating with the audience, which makes it look like she's not alone in thinking this. This way, she can presuppose shared knowledge about these shared and lived experiences, even though this knowledge doesn't necessarily exist outside of her rhetoric. And which experiences? That remains a mystery. The only thing that's important for Megan is to get the audience to look at themselves as members of a group first and foremost, rather than as individuals. Which is ironic considering that Megan and like-minded celebrities want to free and empower individuals. Let's talk about the Dove self-esteem project. You know, I, I, when Dove reached out to me, it was so, as I was saying to you, it's just so easy for me to jump on board with this, the conversation of feminism and women feeling empowered, but to plant those seeds starting really young. And so, yeah, it feels organic and right. We don't often talk about men being imprisoned by gender stereotypes and that when they are free, things will change for women. It is time that we all perceive gender on a spectrum as long as your opinions don't differ from the opinions of the group, freedom and empowerment are great, I guess. Sometimes accurately and sometimes much to our disservice, oh. inaccurately, in what we see in media. This clip demonstrates the power of association. Megan's actually talking about herself, how she thinks she's portrayed inaccurately, but disguises it as a general problem. Megan has a habit of defending herself under the guise of speaking for everyone in the group she's always desperately trying to constitute. 
how have we culturally allowed that to be the case? There's nothing wrong with talking about a woman's success or her ambition. Why is it culturally we are equipping girls and women to think that if you are ambitious, there's something negative about that word? Thus, the rhetoric of Meghan and like-minded celebrities and politicians is actually not individually freeing or empowering because it's designed to keep people in that place inside the group. That's exactly why they monopolize terms like inclusion, empowerment and freedom before the opposing side accuses them of being proponents of the opposite. Rights and freedoms that have been abruptly taken away. L-G-B-T-T-Q-Q -Q. Now let's tear this world apart and build a better one. Rights and freedoms that The groupthink-based rhetoric is even more explicit in the following generic continuation of her answer. And so to be able to have the findings to uncover what we can do to propel that to make sure women are really feeling seen in a way that is reflective of who and how we are and how we move through the world felt important. Does Megan really see everyone? Does she want to see everyone? Later on, Megan makes troubling statements that are inconsistent with her wanting all women to feel seen. And next, it's time for the buzzword philanthropic, because that'll make the speech better. Um, from a philanthropic standpoint with our foundation, there's obviously a lot of work to be done in terms of supporting women and moms. You can begin with paid leave. And, Hello. Uh, <laughs> um, this sounds more like a competition to see how many times you can reference the foundation as opposed to giving specific solutions. Saying paid leave isn't enough, no matter how incredible and brilliant it is. The word philanthropic shows just how self-aware Megan is, aware of branding herself as the good person she wants people to perceive her as. Will we ever hear the findings of this, I'm sure, unbiased and necessary report? You know, and just really looking at, one of the findings actually said that working moms are paid 62 cents to the dollar for what working dads are. And it's almost feeling punitive at a certain point when you're a mom and you're juggling so much and caring so much and you want to be supported in the best way possible. Yes, because that's how you deal with statistics in a totally reliable fashion. You take one statistic that you've actually bothered to memorize, mention it as a literal side note. You know, and just really looking at, one of the findings actually said that... And go straight to what you're really saying this for, to play on the audience's indignation in order to come across as their advocate. It's almost feeling punitive at a certain point when you're a mom and you're juggling so much and caring so much and you want to be supported in the best way possible. This doesn't sound like a calculating pathos appeal at all. Never mind considering the hundreds of independent variables that go into it, to name a few. Who were the participants? Which occupations did they have? How many hours did they work? Etc. Etc. So it's those reasons that... And each and every one of these three reasons, in case there were three reasons. Three key reasons why it felt vital. It's very much specific and couldn't have been said by literally anyone else. I've just always loved understanding women and our stories and our... And what also, the study she found. was asked what this study found, but was only able to come up with one oversimplified statistic. And next, for the third time, Megan mentions her foundation, unintentionally revealing that advertising is what this is really about, disguised as good intentions, of course. You know, we have a production company, and as we build out our slate and have projects that we're doing, or with podcasting as well, to ensure that we are responsibly filling in the roles of moms and women to be reflected in a way that's accurate. So this report, I think, is, is really valuable and just proud we could support it. And yet, Megan hasn't said anything about what this entails, but she did get to mention their great projects and podcasts. She's an incredibly powerful voice for gender equality. Her new podcast, Archetypes, just topped the Spotify charts around the world. And <laughs> She's proud of the valuable, really valuable report that you couldn't reliably cite one statistic from. That sounds about as authentic as the initial flattery. So much brilliance on this panel. There's nothing like flattery to prevent objections and disagreement from the other people on stage. The fewer details speakers give, the more people will agree with their nice-sounding terms. That seems to be Megan's motto in this ad. Conversation. But I think we can all agree that representation matters. And, you know, the key thing that I think needs to be focused on in terms of equity is that it's not a zero-sum game. Just because someone else has the same advantage that you do doesn't mean that you're losing anything. And it actually creates an environment that is so... Fair, but also inclusive. 
The irony in Megan's argumentation is that it hinges on the hidden and subjective presupposition that certain groups of people are more privileged than others. While she is literally implying that she is fine with giving privileges to other groups of people, equity means providing someone with what they need to succeed and is tied to equality of outcome, whereas equality in the original and fair sense of the word means equal opportunities. So unlike what Megan claims, the privileged people will lose something, which kind of shows that they weren't privileged at all. But at least Megan got to say inclusive, struggling to find the right buzzword fair, but also inclusive, and presupposing it as objectively good, an environment that focuses on people's innate characteristics first and foremost, and not their talent and merits. What's not to like? Exclusivity masked as inclusivity. For Megan and like-minded people, it's about monopolizing the right terms before they're rightfully used against them. Megan, will you tell the story about when you wrote that letter to P&G? Because I don't know if anyone is, if everyone's heard it, but it's such a great story at a very young age, what you did. That's so funny. Um, yes. I was uh, 11 years old. Uh, yeah. Now I see why Megan called the panel incredible and brilliant, because this is such a great input. I'm a little conflicted here because I know many of you have heard this particular story and don't find it so great. What do you think? I think you should play the clip, sir. Really? Yes, sir. Okay, but if people don't like it, it's on you. You might lose some of your privileges. Which privileges, sir? Well, you're sitting down, aren't you? Was it a trick question, sir? I would never dream of asking trick questions. I just want my employees to feel seen and heard. It must feel good to be included in this company's decision making. On Megan and Harry's inclusive website, Megan brands herself as champion of human rights and gender equity. Her lifelong advocacy for women remains a constant threat in her humanitarian and business ventures. So it's quite revealing that when it comes to describing what her humanitarian efforts entail specifically, this is the story she mentions, a story from three decades ago which isn't monumental in any way. When I was 11 years old. All right, roll the clip. Yes, sir. About 11 years old and I had seen a commercial on TV um, for a dishwashing liquid and the boys in my class at the time said, you know, it said women all over America are fighting greasy pots and pans. And the boys said, yeah, that's where women belong in the kitchen. And at 11, I just found that infuriating and wrote lots of letters and put pen to paper and they ended up changing the commercial um, to people all over America. And, you know, one of the many reasons why it isn't so incredible and brilliant to be upset about this commercial is that the original tagline didn't exclude that men could also be fighting greasy pots and pans. But obviously, the company is going to address their target audience, just like commercials can be geared towards men. But anything to branch yourself as philanthropic, I guess. It makes me wonder if the other panelist was trolling Megan by getting her to tell this story. Megan, will you tell the story about when you wrote that letter to P&G? What do you think? And next, Megan actually uses this story, or non-story, to give general advice. Sounds like she was truly offended by this commercial and didn't see it as an opportunity to act as a humanitarian. That's, it's, it's funny to look back at it now because that was before social media where you had a reach that was so much greater. It was just an 11 year old with a pen and paper, but it just, I guess, goes to show that if you know that there's something wrong and you're using your voice to advocate in the direction of what is right, that can really land and resonate and make huge change for a lot of people. So your voice is um, not small, it just needs to be heard. By contrasting her accomplishment to today's social media, she makes it seem that more impressive. Not that she's ever needed help in guiding people's impression of her. That I realized the magnitude of my actions at the age of 11. Using your voice, your voice is... Women don't need to find a voice. They have a voice. Platitudes over content every time. Next, however, things are about to get deep. Are they? Sorry. <laughs> I'm not sorry, I'm ready to read this book. <laughs> Megan, uh, I wanna come back to you because social media has really become the go-to place for girls and women to be scrutinized, objectified, bullied, 
right? And unfortunately, I know that this is something that you are all too familiar with. So how have you been able to manage the seemingly endless toxicity uh, that comes at you? Um. Such a great impartial question. Absolving everyone she mentioned from taking any kind of accountability. This is the kind of deliberate oversimplification I thought I could only find in fairy tales. It's always nice to learn something new. Yes, social media is a environment that I think has a lot of that, you know, I, it's really interesting as I can reflect on it. I keep my distance from it right now, just for my own um, well-being, but... That must be why Megan and the Spare attend as many shows as humanly possible, including this very event, and make sure to be seen with the right people. Anything to keep the victim narrative going. These own, facts make um, the word well-being well unreliable. A word that echoes the excuse she gave for leaving the UK, her mental health. You heard Megan share with us all mm -hmm. the moment that she came to you, had the courage enough to say out loud. Mm -hmm. I had no idea what to do. I, was, I, wasn't, I wasn't prepared for that. I went, I went to a very dark place as well, but I, 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 I wanted to be there for her. And also, we didn't leave right terrified. in that moment, right? Because the interview is already presupposed that Megan is a victim, Megan can go on to conveniently oversimplify the criticism she's faced as bullying. The bulk of the bullying and abuse that I was experiencing in social media and online was when I was pregnant. The only reason for mentioning this circumstance is to appeal to people's emotion and pity, because it has nothing to do with what the bullying consisted of. It's strange how this circumstance didn't stop her from trying to garner sympathy at the expense of others. Did you make Kate cry? No. No, the no. reverse happened. A few days before the wedding, she was upset about something. It made me cry, and it really hurt my feelings. There was no guidance as well, right? Mm -hmm. There's no class on how to, how to speak, how to cross your legs. No one thought to say, it's almost as if she only mentions the circumstance when it benefits a victim narrative. I wonder why it appears that way. In the following, she shifts to the impersonal pronoun you, associating with the audience in guiding them what to think about these events. Um, and you just think about that, and you to really wrap your head around why people would be so hateful. It's not catty, it's cruel. What's cruel, specifically? Because the interviewer's already given Megan the answer, Megan's able to conveniently generalize all criticism as hateful. How does that fit into this incredible and brilliant conversation? Next, it's time for more emotional manipulation. As moms, you know it's such a tender and sacred time, and I think, you know, you could either succumb to it. But again, she was also a mom when she made problematic claims about the royal family. That's how it's made clear that she only refers to this circumstance when it benefits a narrative. A narrative that she obviously needs time to recall. You know, you could either succumb to it. Which is similar to this moment. Yes, A, so many of the men were lost in the genocide, so it gave women an opportunity to either succumb to that or to then find some strength. You know, you could either succumb to it. Opportunity to either succumb to that and maybe in some regards because i was pregnant that mammalian instinct just kicked in do everything you can to protect your child and yes because that kind of self-praise isn't unnecessarily dramatic or unreliably hyperbolic at all you know i think as we look at what's happening in social media there is so much work to be done in terms of keeping people safe and that starts as we see what's happening with children um, and their exposure to things. That's true. However, because she never specifies what she means, it remains unclear what these things are. At the mental health summit, Harry made a similar remark. Do not send, or stop, please, please, please stop sending children content that you wouldn't want your own children to see. In these postmodern and post-logic times, things aren't that simple anymore, because people don't define safe and unsafe the same way. Thus, considering that diversity and inclusion are some of Megan's favorite terms, but also promoting diversity about inclusion, and that these terms are used by people who embrace extreme social constructivism, how does Megan define safe? Who should be allowed to influence future generations in social media? This pediatrician, 
And how I put it in words for kids so that they can understand it is, tell me your story. Where have you been in terms of your gender and your gender identity? Where are you right now? And more excitingly, where would you like to be in the future? In truth, okay. Whose truth are we talking about? But also just creating these habits that what I find the most disturbing, frankly, especially as a supporter of women, is how much of the hate is women completely spewing that to other women. And I cannot make sense of that. The reason why she acts as if she can't make sense of that is because she wants people to think about themselves as group members so that they don't criticize her. This exposes the self-serving motives behind groupthink-based rhetoric. The idea that you shouldn't criticize anyone who shares your innate characteristics is absurd. But then again, she doesn't call it criticism. No, it's all hate in Megan's fairy tale. Again, she's actually talking about her own situation, but she disguises it as a general problem. Turns out inclusion is only good when it favors Megan's narrative. Who would have thought? Fair, but also inclusive, because I understand that there are certain platforms. Look, today's a, a really good example. This is being streamed on one of those platforms, and it's also fantastic because people are going to have access to hear all of this brilliance and all of this insight. What brilliance? What insight? If you've heard it, let me know in the comments. Flattery doesn't get more authentic than this. There are a lot of women that are at the highest level, executive level, who are great champions of women, who are great philanthropists, and they are working in these spaces, and yet they're allowing this kind of behavior to run rampant. And at a certain point, they have got to put the do's behind the say's and really make some changes on a systemic level and then... In other words, content that Megan approves of is great. Content that she doesn't approve of is bad. And as we see next, she also has some authoritarian ideas on how to stop unwanted content. This isn't the rhetoric of a champion of anything. This rhetoric is aimed at controlling what other members of the group say and do, thus devaluing the independence of each individual in the very demographics she pretends to advocate for the independence of. Megan continues to speak on her own behalf, pretending to speak on behalf of the community she's desperately trying to constitute. You know, on the flip side of that, we have a responsibility in all of that. The systemic change has to happen at the same time as the cultural change is happening. Because if you're reading something terrible, terrible about a woman, why are you sharing it with your friends? Why are you choosing to put that out in the world? Maybe because it's true. Because everything isn't simply hate no matter how much you want it to be. Maybe because innate characteristics don't determine whether or not you can criticize someone. Maybe because people have ears and no manipulation when they hear it. Uh, you know, everybody up here is really uh, so invested in creating community, fostering community, supporting community. Megan, so much of your work with the Archwell Foundation is centered around uplifting community. Uh, what is it about community building that you feel is so vital, especially to the success of women today? And how is community part of that solution? I think that, you know, at the end of the day, I was talking about it a little bit earlier, women especially, well, all people, you want to feel seen and you want to feel heard. And community is a huge vital piece vital. of that because you when, when you're part of a collective and you feel as if someone is seeing you really seeing you really listening to what you have to say at a certain point you feel empowered when you don't feel alone right right just like she's been using associating rhetoric to make it look like she isn't alone in thinking this the irony of talking about feeling seen and heard and empowered in a community that only sees and hears opinions that align with theirs and so the collective of all of us working together, understanding the shared goal that is in the interest, best interest of our shared humanity is just key. You can't, you can't do it by yourself, and I don't think you want to. Translation time. The shared goal, another manipulating presupposition, by the way, is to silence the voices to use similar empty rhetoric that go against the group's voice. Real equality. Equity. I hope this video made you feel empowered. Click the like button to let your voice be heard and subscribe for more philanthropic videos.